Hi, my name is Hannah and in this video series I will introduce you to some of the new features included in Marmoset Toolbag 4. In this first video, we'll be covering basic scene setup and looking into some of the core fundamentals of using Toolbag. So this is Toolbag 4 in its default layout after installation. For any returning users, the first thing you'll probably notice is that the viewport is split up into four different camera views. There is a new row of tabs at the top left, which are for switching between workspaces. Workspaces are a new concept to Toolbag and can be rearranged and customised to your liking. On the left is the scene hierarchy. This is where all of the components and entities in your scene, such as skies, lights and models, will be listed. If you click on the scene parent, you can specify the metrics of your scene, which is something you will want to check at the start of each new project in order to make sure that the scale is set up correctly. To get started, let's bring in a 3D model. There's an icon for importing meshes here at the top of the scene panel. You can also navigate to File and then Import Model, or use Ctrl and I on your keyboard. Marmoset Toolbag will be able to load most common 3D file extensions, including FBX, OBJ and Alembic. With the model loaded, you can now see that the four viewports here show the camera from the top, the right, the front, and through the main camera object. This is great for setting up lighting and positioning objects in your scene without having to modify the cameras that you want to use for rendering. If you click on the mesh in the scene hierarchy, you can see there's a bunch of options for transforms and import options. By default, auto reload is enabled, which will update your model every time you export modifications from your 3D package. By expanding the 3D asset in the scene hierarchy, I can see that the submeshes are listed underneath. You can click on each mesh to access information and mesh specific settings. In terms of navigation, Toolbag is similar to most 3D packages. To rotate around the model, use Alt and left click, while Alt and right click allow you to zoom in and out. If you want to focus and centralize your model, hit Ctrl and F on your keyboard. You can switch between translation, rotation and scale gizmos by hitting W, E and R respectively on your keyboard. This can also be done via the gizmo toolbar at the top. Each tool has its own settings which can be modified in the tool settings panel. Here you can manually enter values for transforms and toggle snapping and holding control while translating or rotating an object will also snap it by the assigned value. So we have our mesh imported into the scene but currently it doesn't have its material assigned. So let's get that set up now. Upon import, Toolbag will pick up any existing materials assigned in your 3D authoring tool. But if you do want to create more, you can create a new one with this plus icon in the materials panel. By default, the new material will be Lambertian and use the Roughness and Metalness pipeline. Any of these shading models can be changed by clicking the downwards arrow. For example, you can easily switch from Lambertian to Unlit, which is incredibly useful for hand-painted projects, or use Gloss Maps instead of Rough. Toolbag's Modular Material Editor gives you the ability to add other inputs, such as displacement maps, clear coat reflections, emission, and custom shaders. Textures can also be made to tile or offset in the texture section at the top. To start assigning texture maps, simply click on the transparent square and navigate to your chosen maps. You can also drag files from your OS Explorer into the empty square. Once the material is set up, you can now drag it onto the mesh. Or use this button at the top to assign it to selected meshes. 
Another handy tip is to make use of the slider at the top right hand corner. If you're working with a lot of materials in one scene, it can sometimes be useful to drag the slider all the way to the left and have the materials in list format. Skies in Marmoset are a great way of setting up convincing, physically accurate lighting quickly. A new scene will include a sky object by default, or you can add a new one via the Add Object menu. It's also fine to have multiple skies in your scene, but only one can be active at a time. Skies in Toolbag make use of HDRI maps. In the Skylight settings, you can adjust the brightness, the rotation, and add child lights. You can also import your own HDRI maps by selecting this image button. To rotate the skylight in the viewport, hold shift and use right click to rotate. One of the neatest new features added to this release of Toolbag is the library. The library can be accessed via the window menu or by pressing shift, control and L on your keyboard. Or specifically for skies, you can press the presets button. The library is a huge repository of materials, skies and grunges for you to use in your projects. The skies are categorized into indoors, outdoors and different times of the day to give you the most choice for lighting your scene. At first you won't have these downloaded locally to use, so double click to initiate download. Once completed, double click again on the chosen sky to assign it to your active sky object. Now that you've added a sky to your scene, you can start adding additional lights. Lights can either be added as their own objects via the light icon, the scene add object menu, or they can be added as children to the sky. With the sky selected, you can click anywhere on the HDRI image to create a directional light. The color of this light will also be dictated by its position on the image. Clicking on the light object will open its settings. You can easily change your light to spot or omni via this drop down menu. And there's additional parameters to change its brightness, its color, its shape, and its angle. Like any other object, lights can easily be moved around and rotated. This is where the setup workspace really shines because it's a lot easier to arrange lights while keeping an eye on your final render view. In order to start creating our final renders, we're gonna need to work with a camera. Much like the sky, a new scene includes a camera by default. You can add more cameras by going to the scene, add object, camera, or by using this icon at the top of the scene hierarchy. I usually rename my cameras so that I can easily identify which ones I'm rendering from when I'm ready to grab my final shots. With the camera selected, you will notice that there is a ton of settings and sliders to go through. This can be a little intimidating at first, but I'm going to briefly touch on each setting one by one. First up is the limit segment. Here you can control the orbit, the pitch, and the yaw of the camera, or in other words, the angles of rotation on the X and Y axis. Next is the lens of the camera. A new addition here is the option to toggle between perspective and orthographic views. The orthographic view is great if you're working with stylized art or going for quite a graphical look in your renders. I'm sure weapon concept artists will make great use of this mode. When in perspective mode, you can customize the field of view of your camera. By default, it's set to 45 degrees, but the higher the value, the more you can fit in the shot. Generally, for close-up beauty shots, I'll drop my FOV to about 35, but it's always worth playing around with this to get the kind of composition that you want. You'll see an option here called Safe Frame. I use this a ton. This feature works with your image resolution and essentially masks off part of the viewport that extends past your chosen resolution. I haven't covered this part of the UI just yet, but I will quickly show that you can change the output resolution in the render options. You can access this by clicking up here on the render menu, 
or by selecting the render object in the scene list. For example, if I set the resolution to 800 by 600, you can see that the save frame updates accordingly. This is super handy for composing shots, especially if your final render is going to take some time. There's nothing more disappointing than waiting for something to render out, only to discover that you've accidentally clipped off half your asset. Next, I want to discuss focus and depth of field. Tailoring your focal distance is great for bringing attention to a specific detail or area on your model and should be adjusted to fit the kind of shot that you're going for. You can set the distance manually or you can use the middle mouse click. You can then adjust the parameters to further refine your focal point. You might have seen out of focus photography of city lights where the light flares are hearts or stars and you can pretty much do the same by altering the aperture shape. This setting controls the shape of flares and highlights. The intensity and size of the flares can also be controlled below. And finally a digital artist's favourite is the chromatic aberration. This is great for sci-fi and futuristic images, or for adding a sense of realism to any render when used subtly. The camera post effects are where a lot of the magic can be added to your final outputs. There's quite a few presets that you can use or customise, and you have the ability to save and load your own. You can see that the different post effects have a huge impact on the overall mood of the shot all using the same lighting setup. And on that note, it's good to have your lighting, cameras and composition as close to final as you can before spending time on the post effects. The first thing you're going to want to decide on is the tone mapping and it's a good idea to have it synced up with your other authoring tools where necessary. Linear will be the default, but Toolbag also supports Reinhardt Hale and Aces. Adjusting the sharpening can really assist with adding definition to images and materials. And it is also a setting for adding bloom to the scene. Be careful not to overdo it on either though, as too much can ruin a shot. Film grain and a vignette can be added to your images via the remaining two settings at the bottom. One of the most defining features of Toolbag 4 and the one I'm sure a lot of you are very excited for is the addition of the ray tracing rendering. Open up the render options by either selecting the green cog in the scene hierarchy or by navigating to the render menu up at the top here and selecting render options. Turning on ray tracing is as simple as ticking this checkbox. Any viewport set to full quality will now use ray tracing as their rendering mode. In order to change a viewport's mode, click on the drop down menu in the top left corner. The amount of indirect light bounces and transmission light bounces can be set here. And you can also choose the amount of accumulation and samples used. The render output is where you'll specify your image and video output settings. This was previously in the capture settings but has now been moved to the render object in Toolbag 4. You can set your output path, resolution and file format of both image and video output. You also now have the ability to add cameras to the render list and render passes. Previously you had to manually take shots one at a time and it could be a little bit tedious if you had a few camera shots set up and wanted to iterate on them all. But adding cameras to the render list automates this process. Render passes can be used to isolate and render shots of only the wireframe or of certain texture maps. They can also be viewed in real time by switching the viewport's rendering mode. When you're finally ready to take your shots, press the render image button here. Or for videos, press the render video button to export out your animated clips. 
So that's it for this first part of the introductory video series and hopefully you now have an understanding of Toolbag's fundamentals. For more tutorials, tips and tricks, head on over to our website. Thanks for watching and have a great day.